Tell the audience how cool you are. I think that's a, a strong exaggeration. Hey, music, roll the music. Roll the music. All right, we are live. Welcome to the Dream Big Podcast, where my goal is to find the biggest dreamers around the planet and let you hear their story to learn as much as we possibly can about big dreamers like this man right here, Andrew Carrington, one of my favorite guys on the planet, but this guy has got a story to tell. I, I mean, it is an unbelievable story. We are so blessed to have you in our lives. This guy has been the top trainer in, in the mattress business for as long as I've known. Um, but I mean, from you're talking Ergomotion, Tempur-Pedic, um, Ashley Furniture, Mattress Firm, uh, you've done a lot of training and you're a mattress nerd just like I am. And I think that was where we had a little bit of love at first sight when we got a little bit of mattress talk. But beyond the mattress business and beyond what we're up to in this amazing thing that we're running nationwide with you got a pretty amazing story to tell and you are a big dreamer you've done a lot of things and you've overcome some stuff that people have never overcome in their entire life and are, are you know would not have done what you've done and be where you are right now so i want to talk a little bit about that but welcome to the show thank andrew you. thank you wow dream Woo! big baby Woo! let's go so uh i just want to let's start with you man tell us a little bit about your story i i can tell your story and uh it's a pretty amazing story but we got to hear it from you yeah, you know, um, first off, thank you so much for letting me come on here. Um, you know, not not everybody thinks I'm a dreamer. I don't know if my wife thinks I'm a dreamer or not, but she's yeah, on she the does. ride anyway, so that's for <laughs> sure. So, um, yeah, you, every, everybody goes through different things in their lives to get where they're at. It's just about what you're learning from that experience. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, in my life, I've been constantly tested from the time I was born until even today, right? And it's always with different things. But my grandma told me one time, you know, I asked her, why me? Right? I think a lot of people ask that question, why me? And, and I asked her, why me? One time, and she said, you're the strong enough person and you can handle it. That's why you. Um, other people can't handle it. That's why they don't get this these kind of things put on them. But, um, you know, when I was young, my... My parents were legally divorced when I was three months old, and and that wasn't the norm in the in the very early '80s, right? Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, when this went down, my my mom didn't handle it well with the mental state, right? And everybody, we talk about mental health a lot more now than we ever did in the '90s or '80s, right? And so how she handled it wasn't how everybody else probably would, but you know, she left. And when I say she left, I mean my dad was already gone and she went somewhere for days mm. and we had somebody show up at our house and i'm three months old my sister is two my brother is four and my oldest <coughs> sister is eight and that's who's in the house yeah and when the, the dhs or whoever the cops shows up and they asked where our our mother was at you know we said oh she's working well not me but it was it was one of those things where we didn't know we didn't know what was going on i didn't obviously my sister didn't know she just thought hey mom's working she'll be back yeah well my mom never never came back she never as 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 i know of made an effort to come back and and be part of our lives yeah so that started the journey right for me of of a unique life a life that from that point on was never going to be like anybody else's. And I went into foster care for a couple of years. Um, obviously I don't remember any of this. It's just, I know this cause it's on papers. Right. And that was a hard point cause me and my sister were in foster care, but my older sister and my brother went to go live with my dad. So it was this weird time where we just didn't have this connection as a family. And so when we went in this foster care and we were looking to get adopted, um, I, I almost got adopted by a family at one point, but they found out that the husband of the person that was going to adopt me was beating me. And I was like two years old. Right. So, and this all came out in court. Right. Was, and so it was, a, it was really hard. And at this point, my dad had remarried and they already had a daughter, him and his new wife. And, um, they had Irish twins, which is, they had two girls in the same year. Yeah. Right. So it's called Irish twins. Um, and so they were pregnant with this, the second and she had a, my stepmom had a, a previous marriage where she had a daughter from there. So my dad had already had, you know, four kids living in his house about to be five. Yeah. And he found out about what was going on with me and my sisters and foster care. And I think he kind of came to this realization, well, maybe it's time, it's time to, to get the family together, I think was his thought. 
So we came out of foster care and went into this home, you know, and my stepmom, I think was 24, 25 and went from a mother of three to a mother of seven, right? Yeah. <laughs> In a matter of a couple 25. months. And, yeah. And it was uh, not easy. Yeah. And, you know, my dad, obviously he wasn't very vocal and, and verbal didn't talk a lot because he drank a lot back then which is very common and he was in the car industry he was in sales so he was always gone and he didn't express to my stepmom what was going on with his previous marriage i don't even know if she knew that me and my sister existed i mean there was a lot that went into to, to what happened after that but we went into that home and you know for the next 12 years my stepmom was angry she was very angry and she took it out on me and my brother and I will say she did a lot worse job on my brother than me, but no kid should have to go through that, whether it's physical or mental. It, it, you just <clears throat> you shouldn't be treated as a child like, you know, you're, you're something you're angry at. Or, you know, no, no child should be raised in a home where they don't feel like someone's there to support them or care about them. Yeah. So I leaned to my brother, right? Um, he was the only one that was going through what I was going through. He knew it knew what was happening on a daily basis he was there for me i looked up to him he was he he was my father he was my my role model he was the person that was gonna jurisdict what i did with my life he he was showing me what i needed to do right and it got really bad it got really bad and i'll never forget the day that it stopped physically her my stepmom and my brother were out in a house in front of our house in iowa and they got in this huge argument I mean, basically in front of the neighborhood and just kind of goes to show she, she truly didn't care where it was or when it was right. There, there was no limits to when she would take something out on you. And she went to go hit my brother and she, he stopped her like he had been taking judicio his entire life or something, you know, <laughs> just stopped her hand and he grabbed her and pulled her in and basically said, you ever hit me or my brother again and I'll kill you. And I know he meant it. Like, he was at a point where he just was so over it, you know. And I wasn't big enough or strong enough. And it would have been years for me to be able to make that point right again. And, yeah. you know, I look back, like, how much he saved me from physical abuse. Um, and it's just, again, it's, he just continued to just show me, hey, you know, it's okay. There's somebody here for you. Your mom might not be here. Your dad might not be here. You might have this role model that's supposed to be here that's not. But guess what I am? I'll be here. I'll support you. I'll do what I can. Right. And, you know, after that, it got really bad because, you know, now that she can't physically take it out, this mental abuse starts coming out. That's, you know, to me, it was worse. It got very bad. And my mom had remarried to my stepdad. They actually started dating when I was like three years old, but I didn't really start meeting him until I was like seven, eight, nine. And yeah. we We'd go out there for like a week in the summer and we'd, we'd meet him. And what amazing man. He, he was truly one of the, the greatest men I've ever met. He was a fighter jet pilot in the Korean War. Yeah. You know, this man landed fighter jets on aircraft carriers in the ocean. I mean, you're talking a badass man. He flew for United Airlines for 36 years as a captain. Um, the problem with it is at the time I didn't want another dad. Right? I had this mindset like I don't need a father. I have one. Okay, he's just not not there, but he's still my father, right? I still had this, yeah. it doesn't matter if they're in your life or not. You have this view of your father, and it's this overwhelming, like, I've got to look up to him. I don't need another father. Yeah. But I never looked and in, in, in seen the fact that he wasn't trying to be my father. He was trying to just be a role model. He was trying to teach me things he knew I wasn't learning at you know, home. And I just didn't take it that way. So there was there was always kind of this this riff between us. Um, <coughs> yeah. But you know, my dad and my stepmom, obviously, you know, they they stayed together for like eleven years, twelve, thirteen years, and they split for a little bit and then got back together. But you know, it was a rough, rough relationship. You know, my dad, he only quit drinking I think eight years ago. So, and that and that's with his current wife. So, who I love, Paula. But you know, he was an alcoholic. He, yeah. he, and I'm talking like drinking, drinking, and yeah. he would drink all day at work because that's what you did when the car sales back in the eighties and nineties, you'd go oh, to man. lunch, drink some beers, close a deal, come back, make some money. So when we did see him, it, it wasn't quality in yeah. my mind. Um, and he was always kind of sidetracked with something else um, when he got home. Right. And that was that 
he had so much going on and then he'd disconnect. And then yeah. that rift became to a point where they split. And when they split, that's when my mom stepped in and said, you know, we want you. We want you out in, in Utah. We, that's where she was living with my stepdad. And I think it's a great time for you guys to all come live with us, right? And, you know, my brother didn't blink an eye. He had been wanting out forever. And my sister didn't blink an eye. My older sister was already grown, moved on out of high school, right? So it was just the three of us. And I was, you know, okay with it because I I was young, really young. I didn't understand. And so we went out there and it was great for my sister and my brother, but it just, it wasn't for me. It just wasn't for me. So I, I left and went back to my dad and he was living in an apartment by himself and it was just us. And that, <clears> to me, that was great. So it was me and him, right? Just me and him. And again, same guy. He wasn't home. He was drinking all the time. I didn't see him, but... When you're getting to be where you're 14, 15 years old, this is an amazing situation. You're in a, an apartment by yourself, basically, with all your boys drinking. You know, my dad didn't drink liquor a lot. It was a lot of beer, but he'd stock liquor, which was for who? It was for me, right? Uh -huh. Like he, he, It was an unspoken bond between me and my father. And he grew up on a farm where he was drinking when he was like 12, 13. So, I mean, it just to him it was the, the passage normal. of life. Yeah, passage that's of what life. they did. So, yeah. my mom got word of it, that I was in... You know, Omaha, in an apartment, drinking, smoking with my buddies, hanging out, not going to school. Um, got a lawyer and, and came and got me. She decided to actually take legal action this time. She she, she thought, oh, this isn't right, right? Like, your, your father shouldn't be doing this to you. And the way that went was just terrible because it looked like, you know, I was in on this and I was trying to put my father down and he was a terrible father and I didn't want him in my life and, all, and none of that was true at the time. I was loving my life. I was loving where I was at. I was loving how I was going. But um, I think part of me did want that stability. Yeah. I wanted to be with my stepdad to get some lessons, I guess. I really wanted to be with my mom. She hadn't been there my entire life except for just weeks at a time. So I just, I, I kind of was at this point where, okay, I want it. it. Didn't last six months. I mean, six months. I was in that house for like six months and me and my stepdad got in a huge argument I remember flipping the bed over. He basically told me to get out, right? Don't want you here. Don't need you here. Get out. And I was 16, you know, stubborn. Said, fine. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a mutual agree. Like, he didn't kick me out of his house. My mom was standing there crying. Like, don't leave. Away. You know, there was a, you can't. So I packed up this bag, huge, giant red duffel bag. And I put everything I possibly could in there that I thought, okay, if I'm leaving forever, this is what I need. It was my clothes. I had a couple things here and there, cards and, and things I'd collected. Um, Wu-Tang record, I think, a little CD, right? Just, CDs, yeah, compact just, discs. Just, yeah, there compact discs, everything. It's, it's... Yeah, to take with me. And he reached in his pocket and pulled out his wallet and handed me like a, a 140 bucks or something like that. That was it. I walked away. And I walked to a bus station and... I was really lost, and you know, at this point, I said, you know, I'm just gonna go back to my dad, and I was, I was ha at least happier there with my friends in Omaha, and even though my dad wasn't there, he at least, you know, at least I had all my friends. I had, I had a life there that <coughs> I didn't have in Utah, and I bought the bus ticket. The guy never even checked my ID. You know, I'm 16, probably looked like I was 14. I mean, I'm 40 now. That was pre-giant like, beard. Yeah, that was pre-giant beard. Okay. Um, so, you know, I get on the bus. I go to Omaha. Yeah. I go to the apartment we were living in. I knock on the door and a lady answers. I think, okay, my dad's, you know, with another woman, no big deal. And I said, is my, my father here, Bruce Carrington? And she goes, no, he's not. I said, well, where, where is he? And she goes, I think the guy who lived here moved to Florida or something. And that was the first time I heard my dad was in Florida. So... I'm this was just for the audience. This is pre cell phones. This is pre yeah. any way of communicating. You yeah. get there, you're expecting your dad to be there. He's not there. What's next? Yeah. <laughs> like, so then, yeah, it's all your money's gone. Yeah. You got a duffel bag with you. Yeah. And it, I had no money. No um, way to get a hold of anybody. No way to get a hold of anybody. You know, when, when you're 16 to in the, the <clears> mid <throat> to late 90s, there was a lot of standards back. I couldn't get a car. I, yeah. It didn't matter what I did at this point. So um, the first night I was able to call my buddy up, Matt, and went to his house and hung out that night, found out that they, that my other buddy Jared had was working at a car wash. They were hiring, Hey, you know, they'll hire anybody, you know? And I was like, I need a job. So I went, the, I mean, that day, that the next day I was out of job working, showed up in the morning, didn't even know if they were gonna give me a job or not, like ready to work. 
And, and that's what I did. And part of me growing up the way I did, I, I stopped asking for help because I started coming to this realization. Nobody was there to help me. Nobody was going to help me. Oh. So instead of asking for help and turning to people and say, Hey, I need some help. I went homeless, right? I lived in this park. Now I had a job every day and I worked every day and I hung out with my friends and sometimes I'd stay at their houses or with their, their family or whatever. But if you're not, if you don't actually have a home over your head or a roof over your head, you're homeless, right? If you're moving from house to house to house to stay at people's houses, you're homeless, man. It's just, but you know, I, I was so stubborn. I didn't want to ask for help. And so I, I lived in that park for like six months in a park, in a park, yeah, on a park bench. Well, I was under the park bench. I had this, underneath the park bench. I had this tarp that I and this metal bar I found, and so I took this tarp and I wrapped it around the tarp, or the the park bench, and then I stretched it out and created like a lean to, and then that. So if it like hailed, I could be underneath the bench. Sometimes it could be over in this other area, but I wasn't the only person in this park, right? I mean, there was at times probably hundreds of people in this park doing drugs and and ODing and you know you'd see a, a mother with a couple kids and you know, that's the kind of things that, yeah, it's rough for me and yeah. it's hard for me, but look what they're going through. Right. And, you know, I'd play with the kids in the parks and I'd, I'd try to do things that would lift my spirits up to make me just disconnect from the situation that I'm in. Because really to me, it wasn't, I'm living in this park. I'm sleeping in the park. I'm living in Omaha. <laughs> I'm living with my friends. I live at work, right? I'm at work all day. I, I, and when I'm not there, I'm out drinking with my buddies and, and doing stuff I probably shouldn't be at 16 years old. But it got really hard and got to a point where, you know, I started thinking about, you know, where am I going in life? And is this the moment that, that I give up, right? Is this the time that I, I can't push any further? And I heard one night this you know, these gunshots and somebody got killed. And, you know, that next morning I thought, well, you know, that could have been me. And is this it? Is this, is this, is this, how much further can I push? Mm -hmm. And I start living back through my life in my head as I'm, I'm going and I'm setting up the next night in my park bench. And I'm really thinking about my life and everything that's gone on and, and how I've gotten to this point and how nobody's there for me. And, and it will every, it ever be, anybody ever be there for me mm -hmm. and that was the day that my life started changing i looked up and this crowd of people was walking across the park and i'm thinking well this is, this is the day i get beat, beat up by a gang right and it was my friends and they were there to help me they were there to give me an apartment they were there to, to give me a home they told me from that point on, you know, you don't spend holidays by yourself. You come to our house or you come to this place for Easter and you come over here for Mother's Day. And you, you know, I, I was never alone at that point for a holiday except for Christmas. That's the hard, hardest one to get into somebody's house is during Christmas. But, you know, that that shifted my mindset instantly, like instantly went from this is it. I got to give up. I got to I, I, I don't think I can go any further to hold on. Don't give up. Push on a little further. There's mm -hmm. some people that will help you. Reach for help. Ask for help. M understand that other people out there aren't just there. They're there, you know, to be part of your life. And if you let them in, they don't have to be family. They'll become yeah. family, right? And I grew up a lot, and I went through a lot, and I worked at that car wash every day, and I worked my way up. And for like a year and a half, I was the only person at that car wash with a driver's license. That was a big deal because yeah. you have to drive the car from the vacuum bay to the wash bay. Yeah. And um, I was the only one that could do that. And one day the owner of the car wash is in there watching me wash these cars and do this. And he's like, who's that guy? And they're like, well, that's Andrew. He's been here for like two years. And he's like, why is he out there? Why isn't he in the dry bay? And he's like, oh, I'm the only one with the license. So he calls me into his office and says, look, I don't want you out there dry washing cars anymore. I want you in the detail bay, which was like, holy cow. Big promotion. A huge promotion. That's it. And so now I start getting tips. Now I'm starting to work inside every day. You know, it's just a completely different vibe. But Yes. So let me just stop for one second. Like I, <clears throat> I think when we think of Dream Big, we think of, you know, these giant goals and, and people trying to become billionaires or own islands or get their own ships or whatever it may be. 
But in your case, you were in foster care. You were in and out of your parents' homes. You were sleeping underneath park benches. You didn't know a soul at certain times in your life, and you were there. Dreaming big to you at that point was like just having a home, yeah. having people that loved you, having people that cared about you. And, and, and in that moment, I, I think of how many people in that exact same scenario didn't make it out yeah. or would have taken this path so differently. So, I mean, you have a lot to be proud of for already at this point of your story and this point of your life where you truly defied all odds against you. Every single odd was thrown at you every single month, every six months, every year. Something else was thrown at you, and you got through that shit, and you became somebody a little bit special. But it didn't, it didn't end right there, so let's, let's go into the next chapter of your life. Now, now you've got a job. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're, you've, you've obviously at some point in here got into the mattress business. You've met your soulmate. You've, you've started to have some kids, and then more stuff is happening. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so I ended up, I was in Omaha this whole time, and I ended up smashing my finger in a car door at work. Um, and it was so bad that they wanted to take the tip of my finger off in Omaha. They're like, look, we got to remove the tip of your finger. It was, that's how bad I smashed this thing. And of course, I didn't have insurance. I didn't have any, so I, I went like a week and a half without going to the doctor. So it got infected. It was just terrible. So I called my grandma up, and my GMA has always been a constant in my life. She was one. Back in the day, she was one of the first people that tried to adopt us. It didn't work, mm-hmm. right, when we were in foster care. And then she was there just constantly. Like, she was one of the one people that was always kind of in Her house was always the same. It never changed. She never moved, right? She was always in the same house. So she, I called her up. I wasn't talking to my mom at the time. And I said, Grandma, they want to take off the tip of my finger. And she said, don't, don't do that. Come to Iowa. There's one of the best hand and foot doctors in the world in Iowa. And I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. And I know she's in, like middle of nowhere Iowa with like a thousand people I'm like going okay grandma whatever like no way is this possible but I said okay I got on a bus I went to uh, Iowa they she was right one of the top hand and foot doctors worked in Rochester Minnesota he had retired semi he used to live back around there moved back down there and occasionally was doing me ended up re-retiring like six months after he fixed my fixed my finger but um I, I ended up going to Iowa with this mindset of hey get my finger fixed go back to Omaha I got a whole life there got a job there and I never went back. I never went back. I, I got in Iowa and realized, that, man, I was, I was living in Omaha, but did I actually have a life? Yeah. And the answer was no. It was, the answer was 100% no. I was going nowhere, trying nothing. I was, I was in this path of just surviving, you know, just trying to keep a roof over my head, just making sure I could have 49 cents or 99 cents to buy a, a burrito at Taco Bell every day, right? I was not having a life. Yeah. I was surviving. I was barely surviving. When I got with my grandma and, you know, for six months, I was rookie of the year. If you've ever seen that movie where the guy has the cast on and he has the thing that's holding his arm up, right? So that was me. But my f- middle finger was the one that was broken and fixed. And they had this giant r- bandage. And I everywhere I went, I had to stick my hand out the window. And I l- just flipped off everybody everywhere I went. My finger out, like everywhere. And people <laughs> would like honk at us. And just, <clears throat> But for six months, I couldn't do anything. So I, I yeah. realized, like, I may not get back to Omaha. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, you know, through, you know, Iowa has a lot of different parties. I mean, what's interesting, kids party everywhere, right? And Omaha parties are a lot different than Iowa parties. Iowa parties happen on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. And when you come from the big city, just driving that 15 to 20 minutes in the middle of nowhere in the dark, you're like, where are we going? Yeah. And then you show up, and there's like 500 kids because they come from all these different counties to party. And because of one of those parties, I met my wife. And, you know, we were both really young at the time, but we connected kind of instantly and i was in this band and so she was she said she was a groupie of this band which was amazing but we disconnected what did you do in the band i sang play guitar prove it give me a guitar <laughs> man. give me a guitar you can still sing you got a mic here baby let's go no we're all right, all right. continue <laughs> on i'm sorry no it's not. <laughs> it wasn't a good band i'll be honest so but you had a groupie that means yeah there was somebody yeah. there's some good there yeah we had some, a lot of good fans and um it was a lot of fun yeah but um you know that that disconnected and you know our lives separated for a couple of years and i'll never forget i was working in this um mall selling antique furnitures and there was furniture in there and they had a, a couple beds right and i was i was young and selena goes walking by and i was the only person in the store and i'd already gotten in trouble once for leaving the store to go buy some pizza like, because I'm a young kid and I was, you know, not the most responsible. Yeah. You know, get taught the best lessons as a child. So I, I left and 
Selena went into the store next to me and I went in there and was like, hey, and she's like, oh my goodness, it's so good to see you. And I was like, man, we need to go out. I'd love to take you out, you know? And she goes, okay. And I walked back to my store and she was, my boss was there and goes, it's over. You're done. You're, you're fired. Like, you can't be leaving the store. You've done it too many times. Like, just, just get your stuff and go out. And I'll never forget how I was like so scared that, cause I just told Selena that I had to work for the rest of the day and I couldn't meet up with her till six and I had to go out into the parking lot to leave. And I was so scared she was going to see me leaving. Like what happened? And I have to explain to her, I just got fired. But um, I explained years later, but you know, that, that hilarious. meeting her in that mall and having that <clears throat> moment and, and, and having, and, you know, I didn't have that job from that moment on. Right. But that was all meant to be right. This, these moments all happen for a reason, but meeting her is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. She, she truly changed me who I am today. She mm-hmm. showed me love. She showed me unconditional support. She's been there to trust me and be there for me. And she's given me four beautiful children. And when she got pregnant with our fourth child um, is when I found out I was sick. So I had built up a business. Um, I owned a, a sleep shop in Iowa. Um, we did home audio and car audio. Um, we calibrated people when they get, did DUIs. Um, we did all sorts of stuff inside the store. But you know that's when I was selling sleep and we had a business and I was using this business to support my family. And you know, um, one day I just... I started losing weight. You know, I was about 210 pounds when I got married. And occasionally over time, I just started losing more and more weight. And next thing you know, I was just, I was in the bathroom a lot where I was, I was really having a lot of issues. And I felt like I couldn't digest food properly, right? Like I would eat something in like 30, 45 minutes, I'd, I'd throw it back up. And went to the doctor, you know, they're like, hey, we need to do colonoscopy, which I was already getting done because I've had polyps in my intestines before i've had issues with with my digestive system before so i do every two year checkups at the time and every five years they do a scope test so they said hey you know we want to do a scope test and we want to do a colonoscopy and i said okay you know had many of them done before no big deal um had it done on a thursday wife didn't know got called back into the doctor on a monday which was semi strange for me um they've only called me back one other time and it's when they found the polyps that they had removed and they called me back to let me know that everything was all good i went in that office and you know he said that you got cancer and the first thought that came to my mind is what next like why are you doing this to me right? I, I still had all this, after everything he had blessed me with, and I'm talking about God, obviously, but everything that I had been blessed with in my life to up to that point, I still went back to why me? Now, my wife was, was very pregnant and she had preeclampsia, which is really high blood pressure that could not only kill her, but could kill the baby. And she had it with our third child so both of our sons she ended up having it and it was really bad with our younger son and they handed me these pills on monday and they said we need you to come in for radiation treatment on wednesday and i said okay and i walked out of there with this you know man do i even have a choice do i even have a decision here do i what am I going to do? What do I, who do I tell? Right. And I was my business. So of course the first thought in my mind was, I'm telling nobody. I'm telling nobody because the second anybody finds out it's either a pity case or they're going to find out or think I'm not going to be able to do my job and my business is going to fail. Not going to tell my wife. If I tell my wife, she may go into a preeclampsia state might kill her and the baby. Um, can't tell my family because it might get back to my wife. Can't tell my mom. Can't tell my grandma. Can't tell my friends. I got to do this alone. Again. And I tried. For about three to six months. Told my employees because, you know, I needed to get rides to the doctor. And 
I tried. I tried not to tell my wife. I tried to get through it. They told me it was going to be fine. They told me they were going to take care of it. They told me I'd be all right. And then six months in, you know, they came to the realization that it wasn't going to be okay. And I wasn't going to be all right. And I can't do this alone. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Now, we had a beautiful son, and my wife had been, you know, this is eight, nine weeks after the pregnancy, and I finally sat her down and I told her. And I told her what they told me. So I had three to six months to live. I, uh, <clears throat> I lost everything. I lost my business, which meant I lost my income, which meant I lost my house, my cars, friendships with family. I lost uh, everything. I ended up so broke and with no, absolutely nothing, I had to call my dad. And I said, Dad, I need some help. I'm not going to make it. I need you to support my family. Mm. But you got to promise me you'll do a better job with them than you did with me. He said, I'll do everything. So he... I don't know, spent five, six, seven thousand dollars. He came up, he moved my entire family down to Florida. And we moved into his barn. So my dad lives in in Florida and he has sixteen horses on his property or something like that. And we ended up moving into his barn <laughs> with his horses. And my brother was in Florida now too and you know, I got down there and I just I I couldn't mentally live in that barn. I was already so just I was in a really bad place and you know all this time I had, had this mindset of don't give up don't give up don't give up I did I, I, I gave up and when I was in that barn it was like man I, I'm I'm just can't do anymore so my brother got a hold of me and said look well I got a house I can move you into for free it's not in the best neighborhood but hey it's a house for you and your family. And, he, and we moved in there. So again, continuously people trying to help me and reaching out. And, you know, my brother did everything he could to get me that house and, and make sure that I was happy because he wanted me to be happy for what we all thought was the rest. Well, I ended up, you know, we ended up moving again because we had two and two Inverness um, into a nice house. My dad just forked the bill out. He's like, look, we'll, we'll take care of it. I'd sit in this garage all day, just willing away in my own self-pity, just every day, just asking, why me? Why me? Why me? And grandma chimes in again, you know, because <clears throat> you're the strongest and you can handle it. That's why you. And then my, my conversation with him shifted to, when will this end? When, when will this end? I, I can't take any more. I got no more love to give. I have no more pride. I got nothing. I can't do anything without my wife. I'm embarrassed. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I physically am beat. I'm done. Please, when will this end? I want it to be today. I need it to be today. You told me six months. They told me six months. This is going on too long. I can't do this. You know, my son comes in the garage. Now, my son is... I got two two girls, two boys, and, and they're all amazing. But my son is... He's a Mensa. He's nine. He's one of the smartest little boys on this planet. He's been tested. It's proven. You know, he's a 165 IQ. This kid's way smarter than I'll ever be. And we tested him, he's mine. Just want you to know. <laughs> but the only reason I bring that up is, you know, he just looks at the world so much different than everyone else. And he's always analyzing and calculating and he's always asking questions in, in ways other people wouldn't. And you know the thing I always heard the most is don't give up. Right? 
you get in treatment and they say, don't give up. You, you can get through this. Don't give up. Don't give up. You can get through this. And the problem with that is I already had, right? So every person that said it didn't matter if, if it was my wife or my grandma or my brother, it did not matter who it was in my life. Whoever said that to me, it was like blank words thrown at a wall. It meant nothing to me. Don't give up. What? Hey, that's, that ship has sailed. It's done. All right? But my son comes in the garage and, and he said, Dad, can I ask you a question? I said, go for it, little man. What's up? He said, did you give up? And, man, I stood up from that chair. Quickest I've ever stood up from a chair in my life. I said, what? What do you mean? Like, what are you asking me? Did you give up on life, Dad? Or are you ready to die? Mm. Well, yes and yes, right? I mean, I could have given him two very simple answers to do two very simple questions, yes and yes. But as I stood there and I stared at my son, I realized something that day that shifted the entire culture of who I am. And that's you were either building on your legacy or you were taken away from it. And I don't care how big your legacy is and how strong you think it is. If you turn away from that, every single day it's being taken away from. I also realized that I had nothing. I had nothing left to give my kids. I had no comic books, no baseball cards, no pocket watches. I had nothing physically to leave them in this world. Maybe a couple pictures here and them, but the rest is all memories, and that's on them. Yeah. And as he's standing there, and I'm realizing this, and I'm going, well, what, what am I going to be remembered as? The one thing I've feared this entire time is somebody that gives up. I said, no, no, that is not me. It's not who I am. It's not who I'm going to be. I looked at my son. I said, you're way smarter than me. What should I do? He's like, I think you were always happier when you were working. And I said, I thought you were smart. (laughs) Because I was not happier when I was working. Mm. But I had a common theme. I couldn't sleep back then. And mainly it was I was so terrified. If I fell asleep, I wouldn't wake up. But... That night I slept and, and stayed awake because I was trying to think about what did, what, what did he mean by that? What was my son trying? What was the point he was trying to make with that? And it dawned on me, man, I, I'm happier when I'm helping people. I'm happier when I'm, I'm improving people's lives with sleep. I'm happier when I have a purpose and a drive and I'm actually doing something, right? And pushing yeah. myself. And, and he was happier when he seen me happy like that. And that's what he seen me as. And now he sees me as this guy that gave up and just wants it to be over. I went back to work. I, I went and filled out 200 applications. How many of those people do you think would hire me? Zero. I came yeah. in sick, barely able to walk, couldn't even barely stand up after the interview. I had one company tell me to come back when I was healthy. What? Take me now, right? I'll do anything you want right now, right? Then finally, Ashley was like, you know what? We believe in you and what your mindset is. What are your limitations? I'm like, Paul, thank you for asking. And, you know, I said, hey, I'm sick. I'm not going to make it, but I'll come to work every day. You know, I may need help to get up and every once in a while from seats. I don't want to be stuck somewhere for a couple hours. I, I need to make sure people are there for me. You guys, everybody knows where I'm at, right? And yeah, I'll probably spend half my time here in the bathroom, right? I'm just letting you know, right? If I'm here at eight hours, three to four hours, I'll probably be in the bathroom, right? But those four hours, I'm on the floor. I'll give you everything I got. And I did. And because of that... You know, I ended up meeting Mark, um, who changed my life. And because of that, you know, my we had gotten part of a clinical trial um, because I was starting to get back up, starting to get a little healthier, starting to, you know, feel more emotions, starting to work throughout the day, which would make me tired. Got my circadian rhythm back on a little bit more, right? Started getting better sleep, which builds up your immunity. And all these things started going together. And, you know, this clinical trial was part of, you know, I'm one of six that survived that out of 12, right? And I should not be here. I mean, I'm here, so I should be here. But be here. in my mindset, like, you yeah. know, I was blessed with this second life. I was, I was blessed with this opportunity to come into this world as a new mindset. Yeah. Right? This, this new belief of build on this legacy. Build on it. Well, how are you going to build on it? Mm-hmm. I don't know. 
right? Selling mattresses, I guess. That's the best thing I can do. I know how to sell mattresses. I'm really good at it. I don't sell mattresses. I sell sleep. That's why I'm, you know, so good at what I do. But then I met Mark. And Mark changed my life forever. And Mark helped me. You know, I, he was also going through a lot of health issues. He, he, wasn't walk, he had, couldn't walk. Um, without a cane for 40 years he couldn't get up on his own without the help of his wife he actually came into the ashley store for a lift chair that's why he was in there and he sits back in that lift chair and i said mark are you sleeping in your lift chair or in your recliner at home and he said every night and i was like yo like let's go back to the mattress gallery let me show you something right yeah and you know this man comes walking back (laughs) in the store three weeks later no wife no cane and a license in his hand, which he hadn't had in 40 years. And he says, I want to show you something. Stands, sits down and stands back up and says, look, you reset my body. I'm doing things now I haven't done in 40 years, right? And on top of that, you reset my brain. I'm confident. Like, he has PTSD and night terrors and all these things were affecting his life that he didn't realize how much it was affecting. But what he said to me next, it, it, it changed again. These, these moments that happened in this time where I was going through so much growth mindset, right? And he says to me, you know, I love what you do. You changed my life. I'm going to send as many people as I can in here so you can do the same for them. But one person at a time, imagine. Imagine if you could teach other people to sell the way you're selling. Imagine what would happen then. Yeah. It'd be like a pebble dropped into a calm palm, and it would create ripples. I'm begging you to go train people. I'm begging you to go make an impact. See what you could do. And I never thought about training, right? I'd never been in that mindset before. I never thought, can my skills be transferable to someone else? Now, I'd taken this Ashley store from a 0% attachment rate the year before. It was like 0.5 to 65% as a whole, as a, as a store. So, I mean, clearly I was able to transfer that belief to the other employees, but they're with me every day. Yeah. You see the struggles I'm going through. There's this, you know, the way I sell is different. But once he got that into me, I couldn't get it out. And no different than when I reached out to you on LinkedIn, I reached out to... Ergo Motion. And Ergo Motion is the number one adjustable base company on the planet, in the galaxy, nobody better. And I reached out to him and said, listen, number one in Ashley in adjustable bases, just won the Tempur Pedic Award, just got 10 grand put in my bank account because of it. I've taken a store from 0% to 65%. I want to come train for you. I want to come impact your company and, 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 and train nationally. And uh, I got the job. Mm. And from that point on, it it shifted everything, right? <clears throat> My body started getting better. But then on top of that, when I first went out, you know, I was taught by Ergo Motion. You know, they, they wanted it trained a very specific way, which is we're there to tra- train on the, the product. You know, what's the lift capacity on this base, right? What's, what's the overall, how much weight can we put on this? But just the stuff that I had been for, de- you know, you sit in trainings. It's the stuff that's just like, I don't need to know any of exactly. this stuff, right? Like, how does this help how me? How does stop? that help the mattress and how does that help the customer? Exactly. It doesn't. So I had met Roger Cunningham during this, this training process. And Roger owns some stores out there in, in the East Coast. And um, not a lot of them, but he, he's, he's a solid human being. And I went and trained for his team the first time. And it was like a 25-minute training. And it, it was a lot of stuff that I had done on the floor that I'm trying to show them how to train. Not just the, the what we do or what's inside of it or just even the how, but the why we do it, right? It was all of them together, which you don't get out of most reps. They don't yeah. tell you the what, the why, and the how, right? It's, it's usually just one or two of the others. And when I was done, Roger said, you know, man, your story is powerful. And I think you should be telling it to people. I think it would impact. I think it, it, it means more on a retail lever than you realize. Like, I think your story should be put into your trainings. And I was like, really? And he goes, also, I think, I think you need to go back into training more on the passion side of it. And, and, and disconnect slightly from the product. You can still train on the product, but do it the way you've been doing it. And shape your own training. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Now, luckily, I worked at Ergo Motion, who... I didn't really have a boss, so they were just like, hey, if you make impacts, great, right? There was n- wasn't a whole lot of accountability other than, hey, raise the numbers. That was my job, raise the numbers on a national level. Absolutely. And then once I was able to start going out there and, and talk about my story and why I'm so passionate about it, and then talk about the unique way that I sell an adjustable base, which is really about this customer interaction and, and, and letting them be in control of what they should be in control of, which is their future. And Absolutely. Then, tying that in with what happened to me and my health and how sleep directly impacted my immunity system and how it was attacking my system and without sleep and without the drugs they were pumping me with, I would not be here today. Right. They were too connected. Like they said, we don't care what else happened. You have to sleep at night. You have to. 
And we don't care what you have to do to get up to a point where you want to sleep at night. But if you're not sleeping, this is what it's doing to your body. And that's when I started learning more and more. And then you throw in the mark, right? This, this meet your mark moment where he shifted my mindset on not only how I think of mattresses and sleep, but the direct impact I was having to my consumer. Yeah. Right? Cause you know, you know, you've been doing this 20 years cause occasionally you'll get somebody that'll come in and they'll give you cookies, right? For like six months, like, Hey, thanks for helping me out with that mattress. Right. But it's so rare to get that person that actually comes into that store that says you impacted my life. Right. For sure. Especially if you're selling mattresses and not sleep. Right. So there's not that two connection. So and that's know. that's a sense of where we came into place. <laughs> exactly. Like at that point, it was you know I mean this this whole story is such a beautiful story, Andrew, and I, I appreciate you sharing. I know it's not an easy story to tell, but you you talk about not giving up. Uh, you, you talk about grit, and you talk about determination, and you talk about getting to the point that we're at now. You know, and I feel like the last twenty five years of my life is for this moment, and I, I I feel like you're in the same position. And when we collided. This was this was something. There was a force here, but there was there was a history for both of us, and a completely different history, but a history that brought us to this moment to go where we're going right now. And 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 you know, for the people out there, like there's 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 just people that are going through some of the stuff that you've been through. They could go through cancer. They could have gone through some other disease out there. They could have gone through homelessness, the divorce of parents, and there's so many different obstacles. And you didn't just get through one. You know, some people have made it through one in their life. <laughs> I mean, Andrew Carrington has made it through. 50 different obstacles to get to this moment right now, but now you are living your dream. You are absolutely living the dream and doing what you, what your son told you you should be doing, Yeah, doing what Mark told you you should be doing. And we are so honored to have you on this ride on our side of it. And I mean, for those that don't know the story, like literally grit, this guy re reached out to me on LinkedIn, not once, but several different times and said, I love what you're doing, and I just, I just want to, I just want to meet you. I just want to, just a little bit of be a, just see what you guys are doing. I want to see what you're up to, and I, I said, prove it. Yeah. Like, come on out, yeah. you know. And and literally, this guy drove two days across the country to prove it. And still, on that day, I thought, okay, I still don't know what's going on right here. But within a matter of hours, and watching Andrew for the first time give a presentation, I was like, there is something different about this man. There is a passion bleeding inside of his bones that you just that you you can't you can't make that up you know so uh, you know i just i'm proud of you i hope you're proud of yourself man I, hope, I know your family's proud of you i know that you inspire people every single day and and i know anybody listening to this right now is going to know how inspirational uh people are just walking in our room no, just just just, just like that people are jumping in here <laughs> but we forgot to lock the door we did everything else but lock the door but no, yeah. I, pre I appreciate that. And, you know, along with that, we, when I watched the show and then we had came out here and then that night we sat down or I sat down with you at that fire, I remember going down into the, the bedroom because I stayed at your night, your house that night, which is, you know, I had just met you. It was so insane. But I remember calling my wife saying, you know, not only do we have the same beliefs that we can change the industry as a whole, right? I said, Celine, he believes me, right? He, he, he believes what I'm saying and he trusts 100%. me and, and, and he understands me in a way that nobody else has. And, you know, I, I talked to her and I said, you know, but he is, he's way different than me, right? Like he's so much more go than I am and he's so much more drive and push. So I need that in my life. And I just don't know, like, what is that going to do for us? Right? Yeah. Like, how's that going to impact our lives? And, you know, it, it was these, this back and forth where it was all positive. I mean, yeah. I'm like, listen, this, this is, this is what we need. This is where we've gotten, but you know, every single moment that I have been through or that the listeners have been through have gotten you to this moment. Yeah. Right. What I failed to do at one point was continue to learn. I, I, I forgot that, that I need to, to keep moving forward and learn from this rather than give up from this. Absolutely. And giving up to me, it, it's not just, Hey, you know, we all have bad days. Of course, you know, based off of what I went through, I have mental, you know, there's things that go on in my mind. I have depression, I get anxiety, um, I get worked up and, you know, I'm still actively trying to control and work on those things. And I'll never be able to just say, I don't have that, but we all have bad days. But even on the days when I'm, you know, wanting to lay in bed and not get up, it's not, oh, I'm giving up for the day today at that day. I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do today to reset? So I'm better for tomorrow. Wow. Right. And, and the same thing, one thing that, you know, I always think about too, is we are not sleeping to sleep off what we did today. We're sleeping to live for tomorrow. 
we're sleeping so that we can have a better day tomorrow. Absolutely. Right? So I don't go to bed angry. I make sure that I, I, I set and I talk with my wife or whatever I've got to do before I go to bed to set myself because my circadian rhythm, my sleep, if I'm sleeping properly and my immunity is built up and, I'm, and my brain's doing what it's supposed to do, I'll wake up better. Absolutely. I'll be happier. I'm, I'm ready to push the day forward. I'm ready to take, you know, what, what the day throws at me. But I wouldn't be where I'm at without these little moments in my life where I felt this this overwhelming sense of, of self-confidence. Yeah. Like, I can do this, right? Same with reaching out to Ergo. Same with even presenting to Mark the way I did. Taking him off a, a lift chair to take him into that mattress. Gal. I, had, I knew I was going to change his life. Coming out here, right? I knew that there was going to be an impact between me and you. I just did not know how bright of a light it was, right? I was wanting to come make an impact on your company. That was it. That was that was my whole mindset. I thought I could. I thought I, I there was something I could do to show you that you weren't doing. I knew I was going to be able to do something. I did not know that it was going to change the course of my life. That I now, you know, I get these lessons from Mark. I get these lessons from what I've gone through. But then I come here and I'm starting again. It's these growth mindset. It's yeah. like, well, man, I noticed you start to, you really like to live in comfort, don't you? Right? You really like to be comfortable, don't you? Um, and I do, right? But is that right? Well, no, man. Live out of comfort. Push yourself. Absolutely. Go, out, go outside the box. Do what you're best at. But man, make sure you're continuously growing. Absolutely. And I know when I left here that, that first time heading back to Ohio, when I was driving that 19 hours back, I was thinking in my head like, he is only going to make me a better person. George is only going to make me a better person. Eric is only going to make me a better person. Yeah. What, like, why would I not? Yeah. Why would I not? And... Temper tried to talk me out of it. Both of my bosses at Temper tried to talk me out of it, right? The company I was training for with Temper tried to talk me out of it. I had, my dad was like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, so, but it, it doesn't matter. Like, it was in right. That, exactly. In that moment, and we are all on a path, but you are in way more control than you realize. Mm -hmm. And your mindset, the way you think, is pushing everything. If you're waking up negative, you're going to have a negative day. If, if you've given up, you're sitting on a couch, willing away in your own self-pity, well, guess what other people see? Okay? Mm -hmm. I learned through this, too. I could tell my kids everything until I'm blue in the face. I could say, do it this way, do it this way, and I want you to do it this way. And I could try to teach them these lessons and tell them they aren't listening to 10% of it. Yeah, They're watching everything I'm doing. Mm -hmm. They watched me give up. He watched me turn it around. My son's never been happier, right? He comes and he hugs me. He's, yeah. he's like, he loves Colorado. He loves the school. He loves the kids. He loves being here. Like, it's all of these things together. But that's also like, he sees where I'm at, right? So I've never really looked at myself as this huge, big dreamer. Like, I, I consider you, you've got these big, giant goals, right? And you know exactly how you're going to get there. And you know, I can't do it alone. I'm going to surround myself with the right people. We're going to get there, right? My dreaming is moment dreaming, right? Can I get yeah. past this moment, right? Until I met you. And then I'm like, okay, my goals need to be bigger. I think I told you too, you show, what are your five-year goals? I said, I don't set five-year goals. I set one-day goals because yeah. I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow, right? Yeah. But now as I'm with you, I'm realizing you can set up long-term goals because you can do things today that are going to impact five years from now. 100%. And that's what we're doing right now. Absolutely. We're shifting this, this culture. We're shifting yeah. the way people think. We are changing the industry as a whole. And it's because of how we, where we came from and the passions we have and how we've got to this moment, right? Absolutely. We're never going to stop teaching. This is Mark's. You're the best of the best. Mark's dying wish, right? Yeah. Continue to teach, continue to push, continue to impact lives the way you do. So I will never stop telling his story. I will never stop impacting lives. I will never stop training. I, I get a jolt because I feel like he's there when I'm doing it, right? So um, I, I'm blessed. I'm blessed that. We're blessed. My, yeah. My, my friends came into my life when I was homeless. I'm blessed my wife came into my life when I was lost. I'm blessed my son walked into that garage that day to change my mindset. I'm blessed that I met you, right? All of these things happen for a reason. Amen. So we're blessed to have you on this ride, Andrew. I mean, I, I could sit here and talk to you for hours and hours and hours because you are just such a special man and your devotion to changing the world. I, I, and I think this is such a perfect timing because on Monday, something that we've been working on since you and I have met is, is franchising out. And we have our first franchise training started this Monday for five days straight. We have 13 people coming from all over the country. And this is just our first. The next one, there will be 50 people. The next one, there will be 200 people. 
and you are going to do what you do best, and that is inspire, and that is train people. I, I just, I, you inspire me every day, and I'm blessed that you are on this ride with us, and thank you for all your hard work and your grit you. and your determination and who you are. Thanks for all you do. Thanks for being on this podcast. There will definitely be more podcasts with this guy. Dream big. It, it, it is obvious dreaming big is so different for so many people, but this man has been dreaming big since he was three years old to get to the moment that he's at right now. We're blessed to have you on the ride. Thank you, Andrew Carrington. I love you, man. I love you too, buddy. Thanks. Stay tuned for another episode of Dream Big, where we will travel the world to find the biggest dreamers in all the different aspects of dreaming, as you've seen here today, as the sleep doctor was last time. So many more episodes to come. Dream big, baby. Dream big, baby.